So, Victoria, we are doing um, case study research today. It comes from chapter six of our book. Chapter six entails data collection, case study, and qualitative research. Since the first time we met, we talked about qualitative research. What is left for me to discuss from that chapter is case study research and then data collection. So today I'll start by discussing case study research. And uh, on to, when we finish that session, then I'll do um, the next one that will be on um, data collection. But whilst here, let me just advise that you should all note that um, now we have two weeks that have been added on. So I don't know whether we'll even come back to school in May. But even if we don't come back, whatever happens and we submit our assignments, there'll be a time that we'll be doing presentations, whether online or offline. There'll be some presentations that we'll be doing concerning the write-ups that you are putting together. So I just want to give you a heads up concerning that. Okay. And if you have any questions, I'll answer them when we finish. Okay. So what we'll try to cover today is the case study, defining a case study, designing a case study, collecting data, and writing out the case study. We do our best to see what we can be able to cover. Okay, um, so there are two papers that we are going to use for the discussion. Paper one is mobiles, mobile phones and micro trading. If you look at the platform, I've uploaded it. I've, that's the first file I, 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 I put in the chat room. Paper two is on e-commerce capabilities of a used Ghanaian, of a, of a Ghanaian used case, uh, car retailer. You can see that one as um, the last paper. No, the second paper I uploaded. The second paper I uploaded. Then there's a, a final paper, the fourth one. The, the third one is the same as the first one. The fourth one on information development. I may go there. I even though it's one of my slides, I may go there. So, but we'll use them in all our discussions today. Okay. So please, you can download them and open them on your computer so that when I'm discussing them and we are looking at different uh, issues, you can actually compare it and highlight where, they, where necessary. Okay, so topic one, defining a case study. Now, a case study is a study of a bounded system. A bounded system can be a group, can be a person, an activity, or a process. Now, this bounded system um, represents an instance or, of a real or a, a real world occurrence, or an instance or an occurrence in the real world. And we study to study the to study it, we try to study one, we study a case of it as a representation of that particular occurrences in the world. So if I want to study all developing countries, I can choose to study maybe two of them or one of them as a real world occurrence that has similar characteristics of the rest. So that's why I say it's a case of a bounded system. And the bounded system represents an instance or a, a, an occurrence in a real world. The instance can be an activity, a process, or an occurrence of a phenomenon in the real world. But because we cannot study all the occurrences, we study one of the occurrences so that we can actually be able to have an understanding of um, that particular, uh, um, we can have an understanding of that particular phenomenon of study. Please, you are asking whether, where are the slides? The slides are, if you scroll in the chat room, I don't know whether you can see it, but I've put them in the chat room. Those of you, or those who came late, you can see it. They are, in, they are in Sakai under resources, and they are also here. I've put it in the chat room. Files for download for everybody. If you scroll up, you can find it. Otherwise, let me just add it again. I'm adding them again. Okay. I've added them again. So I'm hoping I hope you can download them. Okay, so the boundary system becomes the unit of analysis of a case. So the case itself is defined by the boundary system that you're trying to study. So if you see in my pictures over here, you can see that the, this is a class with uh, students in it, and there's another one which is a market. It can be a person, a group, an event, or an activity. It can even be a process. Now, in case study research, a researcher may seek to explore, describe, or explain a boundary system or multiple bounded systems over time. So that's what a researcher does. In a case study research, what the researchers try to do is that they try to study that bounded system um, or explore that bounded system or describe that bounded system or explain what is occurring in that bounded system or the bound, um, a multiple bounded system, that's multiple cases. Now, what makes it very different from other research is that 
case studies involve an in-depth data collection of multiple sources of information. So an in-depth data collection takes a lot of time to collect very rich information to develop a case. So multiple sources of information, which include observations, interviews, audiovisual materials, documents, and reports. Sometimes so even the documents or reports, some of them may be archived documents. So that's what you see with a case. A case requires a case requires you to a case study requires you to uh, carry out an investigation to develop an, a detailed description or exploration or explanation of a phenomenon, which may be derived from multiple sources of information, observations, interviews, audiovisual material, documents, public, private and even sometimes archived documents and reports. And what go, it goes on to say that that particular case is then reported as a case description and case-based things. So in a case study, before it is finished, you are supposed to see the description and then case-based things. I'm going to explain what I'm saying there. So a description and then case-based things. Okay. Please, if I'm going a little bit faster, you can just nudge me in the chat room. If you have any questions, you can ask. Okay, so let's continue with that. Now let's look at this particular scenario. This is a, an example of a case about a market um, 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 a market enterprise, a woman who who runs a, who is a tomato retail trader. Now it says that Antia Kosia hereafter referred to as AA is a tomato retail trader. She has she has junior high school level education. And has been and has been working as a tomato retailer since June 2008. A works with Jane, who serves as an intermediary between her and the farmers, the farmers in the villages. Jane buys tomatoes at wholesale prices from farmers and retail and A retails them at the market. <clears throat> Prior to owning a mobile phone, communication between AA and Jane was constrained by distance. The limited access to Jane often contributed, contributed to poor inventory management, where AA could be out of stock for tomatoes, of tomatoes for a week. In such scenarios, AA had to buy from other wholesalers, and that increased her coordination cost. She was then advised by a friend to get a mobile phone for Jane and herself in order to enhance communication and reduce the cost and risk of frequent long journeys. In December 2008, AA Purchase a used Samsung D500 for herself and a Nokia 3315 for Jane. The cost of Jane's mobile phone was deducted from her earnings through from trading with AA. They are both using Tigo as the service, their service provider. She opined that most of she opined that most of my customers are in the working class, meaning they do not have much time to come to the market. I therefore call or text my customers periodically and ask them if they, they are in need of to any tomatoes and, and I, then I deliver them at the offices at their offices before they close. The, the mobile phone enables AA to keep record of the contact details of your customers. Other tools like calendar and alarm on the, on the mobile phone are also used by AA. Now, this particular write-up is the case. Now, on the definition, we say that cases are accompanied by a description and case-based things. This particular study seeks to do, um, talk about mobiles and micro trading. So the description here is what you see in the first part that, that gives you the background of the case so that you can understand the case. And that's one interesting thing about every case study. Case studies are always going to give you a description, a description about the context in which the case takes place. Then after that, you go to the issues you want to study. So from this part, prior to, from that part, prior to this part, prior to this, to up to the end here, you are now discussing the case-based themes. The top part is the context in which the case takes place. The top part is the is, is the, the context in which the case takes place. So it says that and that anti-acusia part gives you the case description. Now, why is the context important? Qualitative studies depends on context. We try to, we don't separate the phenomenon from the context. So it means that anytime somebody is carrying out a qualitative study, a rich description of the context has to be given to us so that we know in which, uh, we know the context and appreciate the context in which the case is taking place. 
So when I say that AA can send text messages, can use the mobile phone in a particular way, you can believe it before because you know who AA is. You know that she's involved, involved in the business and she has some level of education. This information about her background, this like AA works with Jane, who serves as an intermediary. All of this is showing structure of a supply chain. All the small paragraph you see has so much information there. It tells you that it's an enterprise that deals in tomato selling, retailing. It has two employees. The, um, the employer is educated to some extent. She has got level high, junior high school level of education. She has been business in, since 2008 and her business seems to be standing. So she has crossed maybe the first three years of potential failure because this study was done in 2011. So she, at least, she has been able to go through um, up to the, uh, the third year and or, 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 almost, yeah, almost the third year. And then one actually you can see that she has a structure on the supply chain in which she uses to be able to um, manage her supplies to be able to sell them. So you get a lot of information from there. It gives you the background. Those are, that's what we call the case description. And it's accompanied by a case description and case-based things. The case-based things are the issues we want to study. So we are going to try to see how these things come up, come about. Okay. Let me continue. Okay. So, when does case study matter? Case study tends to matter in terms in, because of three key reasons. One, depending on the type of question you are asking. Yin explains that case study is very suited for questions in which you are seeking the how and the why. A how and a why. A how and a why. Now, a how and a why question are usually because that gives opportunity for you to tell a story. A how and a why. Number two, case studies matter when the degree of focus on is a, the degree of focus is on contemporary as as opposed to historical events. So most of the time, in most, many case studies, we are talking about contemporary events that have taken place. But that contemporary event you are talking about, the the investigator himself has no means of manipulating it, has no has very little control. So the person has to tell the story of what is occurring mm -hmm. or what has occurred. Good. That's what you see in the case that the researcher who is carrying out the research doesn't have the means of mani manipulating the issues that is happening. So he's going to tell the story of what is happening and then we end up studying what is happening and we have to understand how that thing happens. So case study matters especially because of the type of question and the fact that the issue you are studying is contemporary as we are opposed to historical events. And then the issue itself, we have very less control over it. Okay. And as we go on, you are going to appreciate it as, you, as I teach on. Now, case study also matters when you want to do a microscopic or spot or spotlight evaluation of selected social phenomena or factors in a particular social phenomena, like poverty and livelihoods in a community. So you want to try to do a look at um, how poverty mm -hmm affects people's livelihoods in a particular community. So that will be giving us something very specific for us to study in that particular scenario. Okay. Or in that particular phenomenon we are trying to study, or microscopic evaluation you want to carry out, is taking place, it's taking place in a real life context on natural settings, real life context on natural settings. What is what am I trying to say? The issue that you are trying to study is happening in the real world and you are trying to study one instance of it or one occurrence of it in the case. Now, when you do that, you are able to provide a, a test of prevailing explanations or to try to explore new ideas or refine knowledge. That is the, the purpose of why you may be carrying out this case. So somebody can say that, okay, I want to study rice sharing services like Uber and Tango. Now, how or, or ride sharing service, which of them are I study? I will go to the world and choose a real world instance of an occurrence. I'll choose maybe Uber, which is a real world in, instance of um, or an occurrence of ride sharing. But even in Uber, I can study Uber as the whole institution as Uber, or I can study a set of drivers, or I can study one driver. But my objective is to try to unravel certain things concerning or social factors or phenomenon or economic factors concerning Uber. I may also want to study leadership in an organization. I can choose a particular timeline I want to study the leadership or a particular leadership style or a particular type of leader. All of it, what I'll try to do is I'll select 
an occurrence of it and try to understand and explore that particular occurrence of it. Now, case study matters because of the fact that we want to explore an intervention which less knowledge is known, so that will give us an exploratory case study. Or when we need to describe a real world life, a real world life context in which an intervention has occurred. Like, let's say this COVID-19 issue, and you want to try to do a case study on it. So it's, you are describing something that has occurred in the real world, and then the, you may want to explore the intervention that government has put in place to be able to address it. So that may come from a descriptive case. Or you want to describe the intervention itself. Or you want to explain causal links in the real life situation. You want to just go beyond description of the um, intervention to explain why it is occurring that way, how it is occurring that way, and what are the causalities within that particular case? What are the causes of this particular thing I'm trying to study? So that will give us an exploratory case study. So we can have three types of case studies. Exploratory case study, what we are exploring an intervention for which less knowledge is known. Descriptive case study, we have some knowledge about it, but we want to describe how it occurred. I want to describe the, 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 the phenomenon itself. Or we want to go beyond the description of the phenomenon to explain the causes of the phenomenon or what caused it to happen. So we are going to explanatory, the explanatory uh, case studies in which we are exploring, we are trying to explain the, cause, the complex causal links in a real world intervention, a real life intervention. So what happens in case that every case deals with a real life intervention? The case itself is an instance of that real life intervention. The case you are studying is an instance of that or an instance or an occurrence of that real life intervention. Okay. So in, 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 in in, 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 in relation to what we said earlier about why we do the cases, it means that we can have exploratory case to explore an area where little on, or is known or little research has been done. So that will give us exploratory case study. And then we can also do what we call a descriptive case study in which a descriptive case study in which we need to describe what is happening within a particular phenomenon. But usually descriptive case studies require a theory to guide the data collection so that we can know the limits of our description. The theory can be, should be stated clearly in advance and be reviewed to form basis of design of the descriptive case study. So the case study is built around the theory. That's what I did for my period. I did a descriptive case study. Then we also have what we call explanatory case study in which you are looking for causal we are doing a causal um, uh, investigation or trying to explain causal links in real life situations. So what causes something to happen? And what are the links between the particular causes or between the particular variables? So that one will take us into an exploratory kind of case study. So you have what exploratory, descriptive, and explanatory. Most well, sometimes when students see a descriptive case study, they even think it is an explanatory case study. Yeah, but one, descript one difference between explanatory and descriptive is that descriptive case studies primarily start with a theory, and the theory is what is guiding the description. The theory is what is guiding the description. Okay. Now, types of case studies. We can also have case study classified by in terms of their multiplicity. Is it a single case or is it a multiple case? Now, when we say a single case, it means that we are studying one phenomenon or one case or one occurrence of a real life situation. Now, it is good for type studies in which you need to do an in-depth study about a phenomenon which could be extreme. It just occurred once and you want to see how it occurred. So to confirm or challenge a theory. So, um, and, and where the researcher has not, does not have access previously. You see that as an example here, a failure or success or in a particular event or an activity can be, in a single case, can be carried out causing financial loss to the state, lessons from the SNIT case. So that means that what happened in the SNIT story or what happened in Ghana concerning SNIT, um, uh, financial loss in SNIT is what you want to study. That particular single event is what you want to study. So a case study can be single in terms of the design where we look at one particular occurrence of a phenomenon. Or we can look at it in terms of multiple cases. 
Multiple cases happens when the researcher is keen to know no more than one case, but he wants to be able to look at other cases which may be different, comparable, complementary, or even in contradiction to what the first case is, so that he can be able to come, um, do, um, do a cross-case analysis and draw up a conclusion. So the multiple case means that the, person, the researcher is keen to know more than just one case. He thinks that the thing could, he wants to be sure and rule out spurious explanations that this is just um, 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 one occurrence. He wants to make sure that it's not just happening out of chance. So by looking at other cases, he's able to compare and then come up with a better understanding that, no, this is not happening out of just chance. It is happening out of the um, uh, scenario that I've compared it here, I've compared it here. The variable seems to be the same. And at each time that these variables are happening, this case, this particular phenomenon is occurs. So I can be confident to say that this phenomenon is coming from this particular particular set of variables. So a multiple case study is appropriate when the researcher is keen to use more than one case to gather data and to be able to get a comparison, a contradiction, a replication, or complementary answers in order to end up drawing a conclusion. Now, multiple case studies help to confirm evidence in, in order to enhance the reliability and validity of the research. But it usually takes more time because you're now spending more time on the field than just doing one case study. And it also may require you collecting data sometimes concurrently from two different teams or two different um, occurrences of the phenomenon that you are trying to study. Okay. okay. So topic two, designing a case study. There's also another classification of case study which I've not yet mentioned. I think it's my slides later. It's about holistic and embedded cases. Holistic means that you're looking at the entirety, like you're looking at the University of Ghana. Embedded means that even though I'm looking at the University of Ghana, I believe that there are some cases in the University of Ghana. So there is business school in one case, uh, school of Pharmacy is one case, School of Social Sciences is one case. So I can either compare the different schools together so that I have an embedded case. Within one big case, there can be embed, embedded cases in them. But I can choose to uh, forget about the embedded cases and look at the University of Ghana as a whole. For example, if I'm trying to do a study on, let's say, um, the responses of university towards COVID-19, COVID I could look at KNUST as one case, and I can look at the University of Ghana as one case. I can look at Central University as one case. I can look at Game Pass as one case. And I can compare them. So I have four cases here, so I'm comparing them. But all of them, they are holistic in nature. I'm looking at the whole university as one case. However, I can also compare this. I can also take one case and look in depth and see some cases in it. So I'm looking at responses to COVID-19, COVID but I'm comparing in University of Ghana, I'm comparing marketing department, uh, uh, school of business against school of pharmacy, or school of pharmacy against school of business, and then as against a uh, school of social sciences. So I'm looking at the three of them. So in that case, I have an embedded case, embedded occurrences occurring within one big particular institution. So the case is University of Ghana, but we need to have embedded cases. Embedded cases can come with HR. And uh, if Yvonne is here, please listen to me or other HR students who are there. I don't know whether Yvonne is around. Okay. So what can happen in, in, in this particular scenario is where you are doing a study and you are looking at leadership traits of, of, of different leaders. And then you see different um, jurisdictions. So when this guy was in power, when this guy was in power, and when this guy is in power. But I'm looking at one institution. We are comparing the different chief directors. Chief director in 2013 to 2017, 2013 to 2018, then 2018 to 20, uh, uh, 2020. So I'm comparing the two different, the two chief directors. And I'm comp so I see each of the, the chief directors, a period of, 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 of leadership as one case. And I see the other one as another case. So at the end of the day, I have two cases within, two sub cases within a larger case. The larger case may be um, Ministry of Health, but within it, Within it, I see the different jurisdictions, the different periods of leadership as individual cases that I want to study. So I can have embedded cases, I can have holistic study. I don't I think we'll come across it as we go on. Okay, so how do we define, design a case? There is a four-step approach and there's a seven-step approach. Each of them is related to the same. In the four-step approach, you have to design a case study protocol. 
that will be able to guide you in collecting data to or define the purpose of the case study and then the instruments you are going to use and then the questionnaire you are going to use and then the respondents you are going to tar uh, target. So that's what it goes into your protocol. Then you conduct the case study, you analyze the case, you analyze case study events, if, uh, uh, case study evidence or findings, and then you look for your recommendations and implications based, based on the case that you have actually developed. In the seven step approach, what then happens here is that you identify the research question that you want to carry out and you want to ask, uh, you are, you are, that, that's the focus of your study, the, the research question itself. Then determine the type of case that you want to do. Am I doing single? Am I doing multiple? Am I doing um, holistic? Am I doing embedded? Then depending on what you have, your, select, your choices, then you go ahead to select the participants or groups that will be suit, um, um, suit the study or being able to get information to do the study who then become respondents, then you collect your data, you analyze your data, you compose and write the case report, and then you evaluate validity and then reliability. Now, all of the four, all the, the two approaches are complementary. Just that they are coming from two different uh, academic uh, uh, public publications, um, the seven step approach and then the four step approach. There could be different approaches, but all of them, the most important thing is that the person is going to go to the field and conduct a case study, and then collect data and analyze the data. But before he can go to the field, he has to have certain things to guide him. That's what we call the case study protocol, which includes both the research question and the choices you are going to make on the field. Okay. Now, so let's look at it. In designing a case study protocol, you are going to define the overview of the project, which will tell us the purpose of your project, the research questions you are going to answer. Then you are going to decide on the field procedures you are going to use and the skills required. For example, I remember, um, I, don't, I think this, um, our, our, uh, Isaac can attest to it. When we were in Manchester, we were doing a, a, a course in which they taught us that, which had um, a title called Elite Interviews. Elite Interviews. Even though we were yeah. studying qualitative research, there was a course called Elite Interviews. How to be able to mm -hmm. interview people uh, who are working in um, maybe the H higher echelons of government, and then who have to do with sensitive information and then also have got positions of power. So elite interviews. So sometimes a student may not even have um, um, the skill set to do elite interviews. He can do all kinds of interviews, but doing elite interviews, to be able to get even data from them, information from them, is, is not quite always straightforward. Those of you who have watched BBC Hardball, is it Hard Talk? I think it's Hard Talk, yeah. This guy who interviews people on the presidents and other key institutional heads on BBC. If you see him doing the interview, it's, it's quite marvelous. You have to remember, I remember the president of our country was interviewed there. And as you're answering one question, another question is coming. So you have not very careful, you're not able to, you may even commit yourself by saying something contradictory. But mm. in elite interviews include interviewing um, 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 politicians and then parliamentarians. I'll try and find the, there's a, actually a book or a PDF on it. I'll try and find it and share it with the class. Last week I mentioned a book called, um, by, um, called uh, Research Methods by Colin Fisher. And somebody asked me to send a PDF. I've not sent it. Um, I'm trying to locate it. My dear has sent it to me, so I'll send it to you. Okay. Then uh, after, you are, after you have decided on the skill sets to use, you need to also develop your research questionnaire or your case study questionnaire that will co cover all the themes you want to research on. And then you also develop a guide for the case report. Please, it will surprise you that these things I'm mentioning, you think may not be important. Let me just give a, a little bit of my story. And um, when I began my PhD, in the first uh, three months, my supervisor made me do a literature review, like what I'm giving to you to do. So I started in September by November, and I finished. And I, I, used, I read 50 papers, and I used to do my literature review. So I wrote a paper, you made write a paper on e-commerce in developing countries what we know and what we don't know. So when I finished, he read it over the Christmas in December and gave me a comment, I think around 27 December. Then I, he gave me, told me, that was my first evidence of plagiarism. He told me I did some plagiarism. He helped me to correct it out. Then when I finished that review, he told me that we'll come back to the review, but he expects me that I should read more papers. So now I should read, now that I've used 50, I should now move to around 170, 170 or 200 papers to go through and categorize and use them for my to be able to uh, get more evidence for my research gaps. 
And then I started doing that. Then after that, he told me I should use that same thing to expand and write my chapter. Um, I had two chapter twos. So I had one chapter two, which was the literature review. Another chapter two is a review on e-commerce and development. Before I had, another, um, I had a, a fourth chapter, which was my research framework. When I finished my research framework in about April, um, he told me I should go to Ghana and collect data. That is 2006. Now, when I was going to collect the data, he made me develop a case study protocol. Even that protocol included my interview guide and the letters that I was sent to the companies. And then the guide of how I asked the questions and how which question will come before which question and why. And then the pilot study I was going to do, the questions were in the pilot study. It was a very comprehensive document. Each organization I was going to select, why I was going to select them, how I was going to select them, which phase I was going to select them. Like, because I was going to spend about six weeks in Ghana in April. So he wanted me to sequentially talk about every week what I'll be doing. So a case study protocol is not just a, a document that you just develop and just write, I'll do this, I'll do that. It has to be well detailed and it has to be timed. Well, for a PhD, it has to be tied to your, your data collection period so that you know what you're going to do in your data collection period. Otherwise, you just do it and you'll have nothing relevant to your work. Then you go, after you develop your case study protocol, you end up guide, to guide you to select the firms, the sampling approach to select the firms. When you select the firms, you have to go there and collect the data. So you have to show up in person. Each of the methods you are going to use for collecting data, you need to know why you are doing it. Interviews. You need to know why you are doing your interview. Who are your interview respondents? Observation. What are you going to observe? For example, I had to interview Casapreco. I sent the letter to my supervisor to Casapreco early. The day I showed up as a Casapreco in person, the MD and everybody, I was told that they were waiting in the boardroom, sitting down, thinking that my supervisor was going to give them um, video conferencing details so that they'll, they'll dial in and then we'll do the interview online. So it was good. they thought there's going to be an online interview and then that's what I was told. I don't know how much true it was, but so they were preparing for the online interview to sit down. But funny enough, when I showed up in person, the whole committee uh, dispersed and they told them, go and talk to the operations manager and the, the IT manager actually, because they thought my talk was for IT. When you finish, you need another, you need another person to interview, we'll, point, we'll direct you to the person. So I realized that the letter is uh, when it came from the University of Ghana through the University of, Ghana, University of Manchester, through the University of Manchester's email, it carried a lot of weight and it caught the people to gather together. But when I showed up in person, everybody was went to do his work and told you that you can interview who you need. It is very <laughs> interesting in my data collection style. So I spent two weeks in Casa Preco collecting data. So I spent some time with the IT manager, I spent some time with the operations manager that times, and I spent some time with the marketing man manager. That time, I call her. Uh, who is now a lecturer in um, K, um, um, UPSC. UPSC. Uh, yeah, was the marketing manager. He gave me a lot of information. Then I got to know that Professor Hinson was also doing a similar research and I came there to collect data. So I had to then hook up with Professor Hinson to share data. We call it investigation um, uh, um, triangulation. You share your data and he also shares his data. Then you, the two of you can compare and see where there are discrepancies in the data you're collecting. He was doing e-business um, related studies on exports and stuff. And I was doing on e-commerce. So they are related com technologies. So uh, we both had, we had to meet on exchange and data. That led to a lot of publications together because of that interaction. Those of us who know our profile, you see that most of our e-commerce papers in the, in the early time of my, my, our careers were both were, were co-authored. Okay. So, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the data collection procedure you use, you have to understand it well. Otherwise, you may not know why you're using that. Then during the time I was with Casa Preco, sometimes there was, I go there and then I have to sit at the reception and wait till the IT manager is ready for, them, for me to be um, I, I'm, I'm allowed to go in. Because the reception has a kind of a, 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 an access gate. So until they give you access, you can't even enter the main aspect of where the main building where there are different employees, and even some of the different employees are in different floors. So I'll sit there and I'll observe people coming in and going out. Then there was a time that I was told to go and spend some time at manufacturing, where they do the bottling and where they do the packaging, so that I can understand the process very well. In fact, that one, the operations manager who gave me the historical event of how they began was the one who gave me that information. Go and spend some time. So I went there to, to sit, stand there, observe, and even 
see what we call sighting. Sighting is where people who stand there and they look at the bottles. As the bottles are coming, bottle, but the bottles are coming, and they check whether the empty bottle they are chipped. The, the, there's any crack on the bottle, and they remove them. You see, and the, and the, the trailer is going so fast. And Casablanca was one of the very first firms that had an automated bottling process. So the, the trailer was going very very fast. And if you as it goes, as the bottles move on the trail on that particular tra trail, you need to be able to sight and remove them. What was very interesting. A, a, a opportunity for me to be able to see, come close to the data itself. Then later, I saw that they have put that uh, mechanism that they, that as a competitive um, an, an edge by by videoing the bottling process and putting it as a, a video on their website. Their homepage was there. First, um, it's the first company in West Africa or something like or in Ghana that I can't remember the detail, but that has a, an automated bottling process. And that one was there, showcased on their website. Uh, and I think it was an end-to-end -end auto automation, end-to-end -end auto. This was around 2006 there, end-to-end -end automation, which was quite interesting. And they, they, were, they were boasting about it. So what was I learning? I had seen something on the website, and I had going to see it in the real life to also corroborate that what they are saying they have, it is true. So observation is something good. Then there's also document. Documents is when they give you information concerning their statistics, how much they are earning, what, how much they have sold. I remember the... the they had the finance manager gave me some details and asked me what dates do I want? What um, in terms of their production and how much they made from that? What dates do I have? But they told me that I can't put that in my PhD, but it can give me some information to be able to understand what they are saying is true. They told me that if I want to put something in my PhD concerning their finances, I should use what they have already put out there in the domain, public domain in Ghana Club 100. Casa Pecos already listed the Ghana Club 100. Ghana Club 100, as you all know, is a document that shows the top 100 companies in Ghana. So their performance information was already in Ghana Club 100. And they also used to the, the, uh, annually print, um, 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 I think, uh, the, a year in review of how much they have made so that they can be able to share to some of their um, uh, partners and people they work with. And, and, and also declare, the, and declare their taxes and other related um, uh, financial obligations that they needed to do. So they could show that those documents to me. And the one that were already public was the one that I was, I was required to put in my PhD. The one that were already public was the one that they allowed me to put in my PhD. So documents can happen. Then there's also audiovisual. Audiovisual has to do with the fact that you may end up seeing um, capturing audio information by recording or visual information, either videos that you have or videos you have also recorded. I had an opportunity of doing a lot of audio recordings there, which I went later on, went on to transcribe. Because the audio, when you are, you see, when a person is being interviewed and you are, you are writing as the person is interviewed, you are interviewing the person, you may lose, because of the, the gap, the, the time um, uh, uh, lapse in writing and hearing, translating and then writing and transcribing and writing on your, on your, on your, on your book. By the time you realize you may have um, lost some of the information a person is saying. So it's good that you record and take your time and then transcribe and then listen to the tape of Dean and then after that put the transcript together and send it back to the to the IT manager or whoever who gave you access to be able to corroborate to check the information and ascertain its validity and accuracy. I remember I did that for Casapreco. And when I did that the IT manager told me that oh now you the things that we even said when uh, uh, were at lunch you even put it inside. I said oh it was good information. I said, oh, what we got and we're discussing it at lunch. I said, but it was relevant for the man work. So he, he was, there were things that he was saying in his office that when we went for lunch, and she was also, the IT manager was a lady, she was also saying by the time we went for lunch. And I was, she was trying to just let me understand that. That were the things that I, I said, she said at the time that we're having lunch, she, knew, she was not expecting me to say it and uh, put it in the document. But that's some of the things that come up. Okay. Then, um, so you have got interviews, inter observation, and then audiovisual. Even with the interviews, you always need to know who qualifies to be part of your respondents and why are they there. The questionnaire for the, um, I didn't get the opportunity to interview the MD, the, the chief executive, but I had the opportunity to interview the head of operations, who, was, who acted as almost, who worked very closely with the chief executive since the time the organization began. So it was like just talking to the chief executive because he knew everything that I needed to say. I needed to ask, he could answer me. And where he, where he wanted me to categorically get the information from the chief executive, they arranged to, for the information to be answered and given to me. And then some of them today told me that that information was already codified on their website. For example, why did we start Casa Preco? 
that information was already on their website, and I could get the, the, the chief executive's speech on the website concerning why he started Casa Priapo. So some of these things, you may have to translate from different sources to be able to write your work. Is it unethically not to send the audiovisual back to uh, the company? Now, the audiovisual, there are two types. There are the ones you can record yourself and the ones they give you. The ones they give you, maybe it could be like you are doing a study on, uh, let's say uh, somebody is doing a study on Unilever about their products and Unilever gives you an advert. That one, they are giving that to you. So that one, is, there's no about issue about ethics in that part. But in terms of the ethical part of you interviewing a person and recording, out of permission. Remember, before you can record a person, you have to record, you have to ask permission. So recording out of permission, out of permission, when you finish, you are supposed to transcribe and send it to the person. Now, somebody says, is it unethical, unethical to do so if you don't do it? One is, it's, it, if you don't do it and you say you did it in your work, you are becoming, you are not becoming honest about your, your data collection process. If you go and say that you did it in your thesis, and then um, and you, and you didn't actually do it, and somebody reads it, you can challenge you. Number two, it's not all the information that we hear and transcribe that is intent, that is, is captured the way you may capture it. There's a difference between the letter and then the spirit of the word, or the spirit of the letter, and uh, the letter and the spirit behind it, the, 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 the particular statement you are reading. Sometimes a person may say something, but you may hear it and transcribe it into letters in a different way. My will not catch the spirit in which the person said it. Like the person told me that these things that we discuss in lunchtime, I didn't expect you to put it in the work. So you're trying to tell me that the lifetime information was personal information, observation he had had, that he didn't want it to be known because the document was supposed to be read by the MD and the other, um, other MDs when I finished my write-up. So it is not advisable to put her personal opinions and views in the particular document I, I had. So when he told me that I had to go, when she told me that I had to go back and kind of rephrase the set sentences, so that it don't appear as her own personal uh, uh, review of the company or her passing judgment on some of their own decisions. That's what I'm just trying to say. So some of these things I will not know until I do the transcription and give it to the first officer who I'm interacting with. Now please, who is the first officer? The first officer is your contact point or the person that you're supposed to work with when you go to the organization. Now, this can come at different levels. I'm just deviating a little to explain because I don't have it in my slides, but it's something that's practical. It can come at different levels. For example, when you go to a place like MTN, you may have to go to the, the, um, the, the HR manager or the public relations officer or the corporate affairs manager. Now, when you go through this, the person is the first officer in this case, but that person can sublet that role to Kwamena, who is the head of operations, or Ajua, who is the head of, let's say, um, uh, uh, service, customer service management at the exchange at Tema. So in that case, that person in Tema then becomes your immediate contact point. But when you finish the work, you still have to give after uh, the contact point Ajua approves it. You still have to let uh, the corporate affairs manager, the HR manager, know that officially this is the document I got about your company. So you can also certify it before I put it in my PhD. So you can have different levels of, of, of access. That's what I'm just trying to emphasize. Even some of them, I, I've had an interview scenario in which the HR manager sits in the interview with every other employee. So it's not about booking time. She will book the time with the person, let the person come to the office and she will sit in. She will be doing her work, but the interview is taking place in the office. So every single thing that you are recording, She's also having the uh, kind of a transcript of it directly, either by record or by she participating in hearing. She may not be fully involved. She may not even understand what you are trying to study. For example, you are doing analytics or you are doing something on healthcare uh, policies. But still, she, the healthcare interview you are doing with the, uh, the local district assembly officer is happening in her office and she's, she's supervising it. When she finishes, she's the one who will pass judgment on it that the document can go out or you can put this in your work. And the first scenario, you have been giving another officer to work with. That officer you are working with is the one who is going to say that the work is okay and then recommend you to the corporate affairs manager, the HR manager, or the process manager that I have finished with you. So please just take notice of these things when you are doing that. That's why it's good to do recognizance before you enter into an organization, which I'll talk about later when I'm actually teaching field, field work. Okay. 
So in Casa Preco, how would you have procedured if the information obtained was significantly different from what was, <laughs> was, was published? Are there ethical impl implications from using information in published documents knowing that they will not align with what exists in the ground? Oh, okay. Everything in public information is what the company wants it to be in public, in public, publicly available. So it's what the company claims. That's why I told you that and when I was teaching, I was trying to explain to you uh, sources of data or sources of literature. You should know that when you are picking from the organization as a document, it's what the document, the, the document is what the organization is claiming or reporting that as of 2015, we are, we are we're in a comfortable lead financially and we're comfortable, everything was okay. We didn't have any financial loss. But when you go into the books, there can be financial loss. Now, if you go into the books and see financial loss, you have to be very careful what the company wants you to do, divulge it or not divulge it. That is one of the reasons why the University of Ghana is advising that anytime you collect data, as much as possible, Patrick, you're welcome, as much as possible, try to do use pseudonyms so that you don't let it become very evident that the organization and the individuals you interview can be pointed that this is the person you talk to. I know sometimes you can't do anything about it. For example, if I do a study on government, there is only one Ministry of Communication. So you can't say that you talk to the Department of Con the, the, the Agency of Communication in Ghana. It's so everybody will know that I'm still talking about Ministry of Communication. This one, you can't do anything about it. But especially when you're dealing with a private company, as much as possible, try to use a pseudonym so that it's not readily known that this person is who you are talking about, this organization who you are talking about. So Isaac, I understand what you are saying. But your first part of your question, how would I put mm -hmm. Whatever information obtained was really different from what was published. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, you write one report. So, 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 let, let me clarify. So, so if uh, they pointed you to uh, stuff they have shared with uh, Club 100, okay, in terms of their finances, and then you also see that that is not exactly what uh, exists on the ground, then how do you proceed? Okay. Especially when your conclusions will be based on the published document and not what is actually the case. That's a very true issue. But at the end of the day, the phenomenon of study, are you trying to do a truth study? That's a question I have to ask you. Because every mm. data you collect is about what the organization tells you. Even the, the, the books, please, those of you, you are an MD. The books are three levels. There's yeah. the book that the MD knows that this is the actual health of the organization. Then there's the one exactly. that the, the MD <laughs> and then the, uh, the finance officer communicates to the organization. And then there's one mm. that the organization communicates to the, to the real world. Which of them are we yeah. now talking about? <laughs> but but well, Prof, there's a certain assumption that case studies are, are used for action uh, research. So the, the, the output is that you, you do recommendations and all that. But if the recommendations and everything are not based on, on correct data, then how, how do you proceed? Okay, so you know one thing that you have not seen, um, I don't want to talk about the action research, but action research, okay. case is not just for action research. Action research is when you want to also make um, a, a contribution or change the phenomenon within the place you're collecting the data. So if I'm doing an action research in, uh, I'll become part of the people trying to solve the, after doing the study and finding the problem, then I help them to solve it. That would then lead to action. Okay. So that is one sign. Mm. But what you are saying is true. Case study is supposed yeah. to come out with recommend, even every research is supposed to come out with both policy recommendation, practical recommendation, and research recommendation. PAD will do the research yeah. first. After that, you have to do the practice and policy. So how can mm. I give you, your question is that how can you give practice and policy recommendations when it is based on wrong information? That's the question right. is, who is wrong information? If I report the company is X in my work, then my conclusion mm -hmm. should be based on the X I've reported. Do you understand me? Okay. Okay. So, on the face of my document, remember that even when you go and collect data, do you know mm -hmm. that at the end of the day, we are all looking at it based on the document, how you reported it. So, somebody, mm -hmm. I have students who collect very good data, but their reporting is mm -hmm. very bad and it makes the work very questionable. In fact, they went there, they spent time with Kwasapreko, but he didn't collect the data, he didn't write it out well, so we don't believe it. The academia, uh, in academia, we the mm -hmm. in pure research, or yeah. basic research in academia, the one that is supposed to go to a scientific community. Our focus in the re is the rego out arriving at the answer, not the answer, the rego at arriving at the answer. Okay. But ask yourself, okay. 
Where is the record of arrival and the answer? It is in what we put in our methodology. So mm. I'm telling you something unofficially. You can have a student that didn't do a rigorous work, but the way you write it in this methodology, I followed gene step two and did this and did this and did this. And every one of them, you write evidences for it. When you read it, excellent. But on the real field, the guy has worked there before. He didn't even collect the data. He just took the document and wrote from his head. <laughs> Do you hope you understand me? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. If you know what is required, you will provide mm. a record. But you see, the only problem you have, you have is that you, will not, you cannot generate um, a, a, a people's direct quotes if you don't interview them, unless you are a very good uh, um, actor and you can be able to write people's quotations. But if you want to get people's quotations, you have to interact with them. And by interacting with them, you tell us what has occurred. That is why in your, P in your PAD, when you interview people, you write manager. And then in some PADs, some universities don't emphasize, but they want the date you even interview that manager. Manager, interview manager one. So you say like, let's say, our company is very healthy. We don't have any problem. Then into bracket, you write manager one. Interview date 2016 June time 2015 and uh, three o'clock p.m. So what he has said that this is for manager one. Manager one, he, he he's not it's a studio name, so he doesn't want you to know who manager one is. But he's telling that at, at three p.m. on 25th December or, or, or 25th January 2006, he was in manager one's office and he interviewed him on this particular scenario. That's what he's trying to see. And all of these things is what gives, makes the data possible uh, or possible for us to, for somebody to believe it. All these specifics that you add in the data. Because you and I were not there. What he's writing is what we are believing. Mm. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Got it. It's, it's, it's quite interesting. We are getting into data collection now, but I just wanted to give an overview. But we have a, mm. next week we have a, a, a detailed session on data collection. Let's try to continue. So, you, you have, that you have to use the data analysis technique you are going to use, which are different, there are different types of techniques for data analysis for a case study, which I'll talk about later. Then you develop your conclusions, recommendations, as as you see, and then the implications based on evidence. Please, recommendations are usually going to the organization that you interview. Implications go to the general area, implication to the research, implication to practitioners and other organizations who have do business like this particular organization or other organizations within the context that you are doing your study from. Then implication to policymakers who are in that particular context. But recommendations sometimes are directly to the organization that you did the work for. I'm just trying to tell you that those are some of the differences. So sometimes in the PhD, we want to see implications first. Then later you can add recommendations to implications matter. But even this is my explanation, you may go to another university, they, they may interchange it, they may tell you we don't need any recommendations, just do applications and go. In some other universities which I've seen, they just want recommendations and they combine everything. Recommendations include both implications and then uh, 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 recommendations. So they recommend to the organization, they recommend to partition, they recommend to policymakers, they recommend to researchers. I'm just telling you that sometimes it is style, style. Style is what makes the difference. Okay. Okay, so what about step two, uh, step seven? The seven step was said, the first one is to A, identify, please somebody will ask me, well, where do you take these things from? Please, these four step and seven step is from different papers I've read and readings I've had over the time. So if you tell me one paper that I, I found it from, I will, I'm very difficult to tell you because I'm just, I, I, I glean this or I summarize these approaches based on different, different authors I've been seeing that some of them just have about four steps, others have about seven steps. And some of them, and it could include yin, it includes pattern, it includes um, divorce, they are called, um, divorce, D E capital V A U S. Uh, there are different different authors who have written about case. It includes even Easton. Easton too is a, a marketing researcher who is a critical realist and writes on case study. So it includes a lot of different of, um, um, researchers. Okay, so you identify the research question that, that you want to. Um, research on do your research on now reason reason why research question is important is that the researcher has to define the case to be studied so the research question will tell us what we want the phenomenon we want to study and then where do we want to study the population we want to focus on so those choices have to be made then you have to decide whether you're doing a single case study or a multiple case study then you also continue on and then tell us which participants but participants have got boundary which I'll explain later when I'm doing data collection and I think I may explain also here later Boundary, boundary in terms of 
Participants come in based on the boundary of time, events, and processes. Some people may be in it because of the timeline you're using. Some people may be in it because of the event that occurred. Some people may be in it because of the processes. I told you that in Casa Preco, I went to uh, the I went to the bottling unit or the manufacturing unit where I, I, I saw the bottles and how they were being packaged and how they were being processed. Now, in, that, in such a scenario, that particular processes became part of my learning in that particular study. In another study that I did on the car companies in Ghana, I was studying, I was studying the used car retail uh, sector in Ghana. I went to the harbor to look at how people process cars when they buy it around 2006. I went to um, a company like Star Assurance and sat down with them to see how they process and do insurance for company, uh, car companies. I went to Crown, uh, Crown, I think Crown, uh, Crown Partners or Crown Agents. They are, it's a subsidiary of the Star, the Star Assurance Group. They were also giving insurance to uh, car, um, people who buy cars and people who are dealing in car, selling cars. I went to sit with them. I went to a company that gives loan to people who want to borrow and, and buy cars. And I went to sit down with them too. I went to um, Ridge, um, Ridge Hospital and sat down with a doctor who wanted to buy a car from somebody online. And the person was now doing the trade. So I sat down to see how the transactions took place. I saw the person carrying the laptop, showing the video, uh, pictures of the cars. So at that time, internet was not quite prevalent like this where you do everything on your phone. If you want to buy a car, the person downloads the pictures, collects the pictures from somebody from Germany, emails the pictures to a friend, so the person wants to buy the car, the person watches, looks at the pictures and chooses the car he wants to buy. So I went to Ridge Hospital, I went to, I sat down with a medical doctor who was buying the car from this particular agent who was selling the cars through online means and you look at the pictures of the cars and make a choice. I also went to a bank to see to see how transactions are done when the cars are being purchased. I, were, I, I was there when money was being paid into the account of the person who was buying the car, and who, the, the, the account, who, account of the dealer, the car dealer, and then the, and the car dealer was giving receipt to the person who was buying the car. Now, all of this is somebody's approve. Why do you go through all this? Thing? This is what helps me to gain a good and rich understanding of what, occurred, of what occurs in buying a car through online processes in Ghana so that I can write my case study well. And I also went to customs, sat down with agents to see how agents process cars when the, a person is not in Ghana and buys a car and sends it to an agent to process the car for the person. I did all this type of background work. I did all this type of background work. Okay. Now, I just want to give you an, 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 a scenario that sometimes the process you are studying, because the process involves a lot of touch points, the marketers will explain what the touch point is. It means that you meet different people on the way, even with the services exchanging the, uh, goods and exchanging value. So at the insurance value is being exchanged. At the harbor, at the agency, agent's place, with the car agent place, the car dealer's place, value is being exchanged. At the agency, where who will process your car for you, value is being exchanged. At the bank, value is being exchanged. At the hospital, the person showing the pictures to the person, and then the person making a choice of the car, value is being exchanged. At Ghana Commercial Bank, I remember very much, Ghana Commercial Bank, um, the one at uh, Burma Camp, we went there to make a payment because a, a soldier had been bought a car. The soldier was in Lebanon. He bought a car from the guy, the, somebody online, and the car was supposed to be delivered to the woman, the wife who was working in Ghana Commercial Bank at that place. And I went there and I saw the soldier's wife and the soldier's wife, this was the second car they were buying from that particular um, dealer. So sometimes you go through all of this and you build a rich story that these things are true. People buy cars online. I was establishing the truth about the car buying processes in Ghana. And that's one of the case studies we'll be looking at as we go on. So don't think that your boundary is just about, because you're studying University of Ghana, you're just talking to the University of Ghana people. If you are studying, uh, let me just give you a scenario. You are studying factors that influence students' learning behavior. If you don't take care, you may have to study people's homes and family, where they stay, which hostel they are in, how far they live away from the university, if you are doing a proper case study. How long have they been staying there? Some students um, have temporary places of staying. During the weekday, they come and stay with their friends on campus, and during the weekend, they go back to their actual home or their hostel, which is far off campus. So it depends on where they stay. 
So I mean, I have to study all these things. And I, I know students who study in the, who actually uh, stay, um, on the weekend come and stay, stay in the business school. I met somebody, he lives, um, he, he, he works at Akosumbu. So he has to do a uh, um, weekend MBA. When she comes, when he comes on Friday, he stays in business school till the next day, on Saturday, and leaves the business school. Sometimes he sits in the car and sleeps in his car. And then after the next day, he goes, that's his core classes, and then drives back to Akosumbu. So if I'm studying factors that influence students' learning behavior, this information will be very interesting to uncover, unravel. This is what you're not getting quantitative. You get it is only based in qualitative. Okay. Then you collect your data from multiple sources of data and triangulate it from the multiple sources. You need to know the multiple sources you're going to use and why you are using them. Then you analyze the data, you compose your report, which is a vivid and detailed explanation of what occurred in the holistic manner or in the embedded manner, depending on what you're trying to do, and you ensure validity and reliability. Okay. So now let's look at collecting the data for case study. For case study. We'll be doing collection of data in general next week, but this one for case study. Now, there are factors that influence the choice. Okay, there's a question here. Prof, some writers have suggested that um, categorization of cases, yeah, intrinsic, instrumental, and, and collective. Is it? Hmm. Is it accurate to say single case studies are linked to intrinsic case studies and multiple alleged instrumental case studies? Okay. To tell you the truth, if I have to explain it, I have to answer your question. I have to explain what intrinsic, instrumental, and collective. But I have it in my book. I don't have it on slide, on slide here. And I, I don't have it offhand to know the distinct differences. I know what you're talking about, the same differences between them. So can you pardon me, Isaac, so that I can take this question and then come back next week with the answer for it? Because I would like, I would like to um, do the differences and show the differences about them. Some of these things is more about how the case study is designed and, and, and the case study is written. That's why, sorry, let me just, that's why you have it um, as intrinsic, instrumental, and then collective. Okay. Okay, okay, so, that's uh, okay. Please just pardon me with that one. Okay. All right, that's okay. Okay, but let me just tell you something. You can, there's even more classification. This is even one of them. If you read different different authors, they have all their own way of classifying case studies. Holistic, okay. and intrinsic, instrumental, and collective, exploratory, explanatory, and this. There are so many different ones. The historical okay. and longitudinal cases, there are many categorization. All of them have to do with the purpose of the case. What is it going to be used for? The purpose of the case. Mm. What is it going to be used okay. for? Okay. Now, all let right. me discuss this one, which is important. Some students don't know this. And the reason why I'm saying I'm discussing this is that when you are in your methodology section of your work and somebody is asking that, why did you choose case study? How did you make these choices? Sometimes you need to explain that you are making these choices because of A, the research gaps, purpose and objectives and, of your, uh, 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 objectives and the questions you have. That is why you are choosing case study. Or the nature of your theory or conceptual framework. Or whether you are going in the phenomenon you are studying, you are trying to do study it in a holistic manner, embedded manner, or in a single manner or in a, or a multiple manner. And then the boundary sources of data. Well, what is available and what is accessible? What is available and what's accessible? Now, let me explain that one briefly. What's available and what is accessible? Then the skills and resources of the researcher. Skills and resources is, is the same. The skill set of the researcher, can you do this type of interviews? Then the uh, resources, do you have even time to even do this extensive review? Recently, um, um, I did a mock viva with a student who was doing a study on Ghanaians. Um, she has passed the, the PhD, all right. The Ghanaians and um, she, did a, she did a qualitative study on Ghanaian, Ghanaians living in Canada and how um, it affects migration, how it affects, I think, um, something to do with um, healthcare and brain green. I can't remember the title of the work. But, but the whole work was about experiences of migrants and how they work in, 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 the, in their homes in the foreign country. And we're looking at ca Canadians. So I asked her a question that, ah, you, how do you ask, answer, get people to answer all these questions? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Now you're studying Canada. So do you travel and go live in Canada to ask them, interview all these people? She told us that she's a pastor's wife. They are, and they are, the pastors are in the community. So you know the Ghanaian churches in, the, in Canada. So all you had to do was to interview the Ghanaian churches, the members of Ghanaian churches in Canada. And you're using the pastors network, which is very interesting. 
So I can just imagine that you that you want to do the study, you don't have, you're not a pastor's wife or you're not a pastor yourself. And I, I wonder how you can have access to the, a very good network of Ghanaians in, in, in Canada to do interviews with. So that's how she, she, she collected the data. Sometimes you have to draw from um, um, what is available and what is accessible to you. Sometimes something is available, but it's not accessible. Why am I saying that? A student in Manchester was doing a study on um, the impact of banking reforms. And he said the impact of banking reforms on corporate governance in banking sector. And he, was, and he went to Bank of Ghana to collect data. Now when he went there, he wanted to collect data as far as 1983, because there are a lot of banking reforms and economic reforms that have taken place since that time. One thing that Bank of Ghana told him was that anybody who can answer questions on that is either now very old or has passed on. So we can't answer the questions from the 1980s. However, if you can change your timeline to around the late 1990s, there are people in the office who can answer your questions for you. But if you insist you want to do 1983, then please, our library is here. Go and sit in our library. There is longitudinal data there, information that is there, which has been codified. You can go and read about it. But maybe it may not answer your research question based on the variables you are studying. But there's a lot of information about uh, the bank and what it went through in the 1980s up to now in our library. So you see what's happening. You, the, 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 this one, there's accessibility, but the data is not available. And sometimes there's availability, but what is available is very, um, is, is restricted to a particular timeline. Okay. Somebody is asking a prof, single case study is supposed to either confirm or challenge a theory. Does it mean that the single case study must be discreted? No, doesn't mean that. You can use it to also do uh, explanatory. When we say it must be, it didn't say that, that my slide is not saying that it must be used. It's just that it, is, it could be primarily used or it is used for that. Don't say that it, is, it must be used. And at the PhD level, you have to be very careful how you use the words must and stuff. Most of the time it's recommendations. And so, so, so it, also, it could also be coming from who is the author, who is writing that, who is the author who is writing it. Because you have got positivist case studies coming from someone like Yin. Yin is a positivist, but he has one of the best case studies book in the, in, in, in the world. Case study research by Yin. But if you are reading Yin and you don't know that, you don't remember that Yin is a positivist, sometimes you may just take what she is saying and then run with it. If you want to read about interpretive case studies, you want to read the work of Walshman. Walsham, 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 Geoff Walsham. You want to read the work of Walsham. Walsham has a lot on interpretive case studies. If you want to read Critical realist case study or realism case study, you have to read the work of Easton. Easton is a marketer. He writes on critical realism case studies. So the case studies, you have to be very careful whose literature you are reading. Divorce has, uh, divorce has a, a, a book on, um, um, a section of his work about case studies. He's also a, crit a, a critical realist. So you have to be very careful who you are um, relying on and, the, this, and the, the, the philosophy they belong to. This, you are the PhD student, so I can explain this one to you. Usually, I'm not teaching in a master's class. So don't say, don't see something. Just say that uh, because it is, it is like this. It may become a positivist explanation of the case study. There, so if you look at Walsham's explanation of case studies, you get the interpretive dimension of how they use case study, how they see case study. If you look at the work of Easton, you see how case studies are seen in the dimension of causality a lot, trying to explain cause, causal relationships and causal mechanisms. That is what you see from a critical realism and so on, from someone like Easton. If you look at it from Jin, Jin has an understanding that you don't have, you are studying, you are using case study to understand a contemporary event in which you don't have much control about or much control of. So that's what you are using a case study for and to answer the question of why and how. Okay. So let's look, let me just, I use that one to explain it so that you can understand your answer, that, the answer to your question on what you are trying to emphasize here. So we have a number of influencing factors. Let us take them one by one. Okay, so now let's take the first one, research gaps and research objectives and questions. You see, whenever you are starting a case, you are going to have a questionnaire. Your questionnaire will have information concerning your questions. So your research questionnaire will guide us to you to collect data. And the data you are going to collect Will be, will be used to analyze and to have an answer to the phenomenon. So when you look at it here, you have your field notes, introduction to research, demographics of the, of the, of the person or the company, 
the main questions which will stem from your the concept of variables you are going to study. And then the other ones which will come up from hypothesis or proposition that you have pointed out. Then other questions which will also come from semi-structured world, asking questions. Sometimes you are interviewing somebody, other questions you didn't pre, um, even conceptualize in the beginning may come up. And then you review your answers. So if you don't have research questions or research gaps, you can't even start a case study work because you don't know what question you are trying to answer. The question you are trying to answer is what will give you information on what you ask on the field of study. The question you are trying to answer what will give you information on what you ask on the field of study. So an example, the student is doing a study and then he goes to say that he wants to do a study on, this is paper one, the paper one that we're using, um, the one on mobiles and micro trading. What is the impact of mobiles on micro trading activities of, of market traders? And he asked questions, how do market traders use mobiles? What benefits do market traders obtain? What is the impact of, benef of the benefits of benefits of using mobiles in micro trading activities of market traders? Because of the questions the woman has, when she's doing a case study, she's going to make sure she asks questions that will capture all the three. And those ones will guide her in her data collection. So there will be a section of her data collection that will ask questions on why you do why do you use a mobile phone? And then why do you use it in business? How often do you use it in business to get how do you use it in business? Does your business fund your, your mobile calls and then your mobile text messages? These are things that will come up. What benefits do you as a marketing man gain from using the mobiles? How are the benefits okay? In what scenarios is the benefits okay? All these things will come up. Then number three, what's the impact of the benefits on using mobiles, it will also come up. So the questions that you have will guide the collection of the data. And then it will guide the way the case study itself gets information is now uh, and answers the information or even structures structure the information. Okay, so now you, you have that one on. The next one has to do with the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework or the theoretical framework. The theoretical framework and conceptual, or conceptual framework is what the theory that or that and or your conceptualization of how to address the issue or the theory that underpin the issue you are trying to study. Now, in this particular scenario, because our questions are three, my question, my conceptual framework also depicts three different aspects of a of of um, um, a concept that have been put together. So the first one is that the mobile phone will be adopted by the trader. It will be used for pre-trade, during trade and post-trade activities. That will lead to certain benefits. And then benefits will lead to a particular type of impact. So when I'm choosing my questions and I'm choosing my respondents and I'm making choices, I need to make sure that my choices are based on this particular set of questions, this particular framework. Now, with looking at the framework, I could actually do a single case in which I could focus on one market to one and ask her questions about stages of trading. I can also ask questions about benefits and I can also ask questions about impact. But to be able to corroborate my findings and then compare and get validity to my work, I could actually compare it in two cases. Like we saw it in that case, he said, I could actually do here, I do it for collect data on stages of trading benefits and impact, but for one case A and then case B, and after that, compare them in my discussion. Okay. So that will be for the um, conceptual framework. Now, if I want to do a multiple case, that means I'm going to end up comparing the findings and then trying to be able to get much more um, a more valid evidence or reliable evidence for my particular questions that I'm trying to answer. So let's look at example one. This is case B. Case B here is about um, Hajia, who is um, a maize seller. And this is also about micro, micro, mobiles and micro trading. And the first part tells you the context about, this the one is called Grace, not Hajia, sorry. The one is called Grace. Hajia is another one. It's a study that we did in Nigeria, a similar study. Okay, so maize is a seasonal produce that requires cost saving techniques in, in trading activities. The old dry maize is preferred to, to the fresh one. For this reason, planting and harvesting are well planned by farmers. Maize wholesalers buy produce from farmers in villages and sell to retailers in Accra, the capital city. Grace is a maize maize retail wholesaler who has four retailers in Accra. She has primary school level education and has learned learned the train from her mother. 
Grace uses two Nokia 3310 mobile phones and subscribe to MTN Litigo network services. The mobile phone has made it easy for her to carry out her transactions more efficient. Grace, she, Grace does not have to travel frequently to do her business unless she has to go around to collect payments. So you see here that we are trying to give you the context in which Grace works in, the background of Grace, so that when we start talking about the, the actual findings of what Grace does, we can be able to see the themes that we need to study. So when I go on, say Grace explains that, then she tells you about a scenario of using it. Then another one, she says that she, she tells about another scenario of using it. So what we have here is that the background is giving us a good understanding as the bedrock to appreciating Grace and her business. Good. So this is one case. The other case we read earlier was AA, Antiochia. Now you are reading that of Grace. So you have got multiple case studies playing in this particular simple study on mobiles and micro trading. Okay. So to be able to collect your data, you need to develop what we call the case study um, report. That's one usually to come out, out, out after you finish your study. So in reporting the case study, you may end up coming up with this particular outline. Now the case study report is just the, a collection or uh, the final data, a summary of the, no, in fact, the, it entails, the, it entails the, the data that you collected from the film, put, it, put together in the form of a report. So it will have the case context, the background to the phenomenon, and then the case-based phenomenon you are trying to study. The case context, the background to the phenomenon, and the case phenomenon you are trying to study. So let's look at it. First of all, how do we write a case report? Now, the reason why I'm talking about a case report is that if you want to know how to write cases, it is better to know the output you are looking for so that you can work backwards on how to produce the output. So that's what I'm trying to do here. I'm showing you that the output you are looking for is the case report. To be able to develop the case report, then let me go backwards and then establish what goes into developing the case report. And then, then when I go backwards and establish what goes into developing the case report, I can tell what data I'm supposed to collect. The first one is, is the context of the issue, the context. The context of the firm, if you are doing a firm level study, the context of the firm, if you are doing an industry level study, the context of the industry. Sometimes if you are doing a, doing a firm level study, you may even need to explain the industry. So I'm explaining, I'm going to have the case context that could consist of the firm profile, which will explain the what, the who, the how, the structure, the resources, the financial performance and achievements that have been achieved. Okay. So an example is in paper two, which we'll look at. Then we'll go to the background to the phenomenon and the case phenomenon. So let's look at an example here. So I'm going to go to our paper on okay. Good. You can see e-commerce to have little Ghanaian use of a Ghanaian used car retailer. So you see how it starts. It starts from the firm profile. The firm profile gives us an overview of the firm that we are trying to study and how that firm began. An overview of the firm that we are trying to study and how that firm began. And how that firm began. Okay. So here, the, so remember what I showed you in my slide, that the case is supposed to, the case is supposed to have a case context. The case context will define the core, the when, the who, the how, it just gives us a background of the case. So this one says that the firm began in 2003 as a merchant, general merchant, which sold used cars to Ghanaians through the internet. The company was registered in 2004 as a sole proprietorship firm and became a limited liability in 2005. The objective of the firm is to provide Ghanaians with a convenient medium for buying their choice cars at a relatively affordable price. A car was imported to Germany through a partnership. The company cars are imported to Germany through a partnership with a German used car retailer. The firm has no fiscal warehouse or showroom. The cars are available. The cars available for purchase are catalog on the website. Potential customers, all this is telling you the process in which they do their business. Now pause here. All this you are seeing here is telling you about the organization. Go down here. The firm has two business units the automobile business unit, and then the website business unit. So that's one tells you about the company. The firm operates as a staff of five core members, 
two of whom are more full-time employees, and then two directors, and then one internet marketing um, strategist. So you see that one too. The IT resources of the firm consist of two Pentium Pentium 4 um, computers, which is, which is quite necessary here to mention them because you're doing an IT study and you want to mention them because you're going to, use, you're going to inform the study you're doing. Okay. And then you can see that the, at the end, it tells you table one shows here. Table one shows the number of cars sold between 2004 and 2007. So let's look at table one. Look at it here. Financial profile of Lanka Consult. Net profits of cars after tax, after sales tax, uh, car, car sales tax in the US. Okay. The net profit after tax in terms of web design. And the number of cars sold, the number of employees. So you start seeing what business the company is doing. In the 2014, it made $6,850. By 2006, it made $24,600. I told you that some of the data may be available, others may not be available. So you see the 2007 data was not available. But I, I went there in 2006 to collect my data. So it's possible that 2007 is not available. Okay, so that's very good. Now what you see here is showing you what goes into a case study, what goes into a case study. Now look at this same thing and compare it with that of anti -Akusia. Okay, anti -Akusia. okay, good. Now, what anti -Akusia's own, I want to go to the case itself. Okay, so you can just see Case A, the tomato retailer. Antia Kusia, hereafter referred to as A, is a tomato retail trader. She has junior high school level of education, has been working as a tomato retailer since 2000, June 2008. A works with Jane. Now, do you realize that it's the same thing that you saw in the previous paper on Lanka Consul? But Lanka Consul has the flexibility of writing a whole case study paper. So the whole paper is a case study. So there's room for you to put in more information. However, Antia Kosia's story in this paper is an academic paper which is research. So Antia Kosia is a small case study that you are actually introducing here because the other is another case study. So sometimes you're, you, you, you realize that you collect your data but you end up writing it based on the, how much you need to write for a given paper that you are supposed to put across. So you see the same thing happening here. And, Tia, and AA works with Jenny all talking about the, the structure, the number of employees she has and the structure of her business. And the fact that she thinks she's even losing um, her relationship with some of the farmers and all kinds of stuff. All these things are things, uh, or gaining or losing relationship, all these are things that come in in Antia Kusia's story in this particular uh, section. So everything that is here is just about Antia Kusia, giving us a background. That is what I was trying to emphasize in my slides here, that you start with the case context. The case context. You start with the case context. You start with the case context. Start with the case context. Okay, so let's let's continue. Let's continue. Sorry, I've, been, I've missed my slides. I have the case context. So in the case context will tell us who, the what, the how, the structure, the resources, achievement, and financial performance. Please, it's not all the cases that you need financial performance in. It's not all the cases that you get achievements in. It's not all the cases that you get some of the information, but as much as possible, give us the relevant background information to understand what you are going to read. Because this is a description of the case, the background content, the rich context in which the case is taking place. Give us that information so that we can have a better understanding of what is, is occurring. Okay. Now, because of the fact that you are picking the data to be able to write the case context, you need to define your respondents. Your respondents are you selected by a boundary. I mentioned it earlier. What is the boundary? The boundary can either be direct or indirect or external or cross boundary. And your boundary can also be time related, transitional, event based, or snowball respondent. These are all type of different respondents that you are going to see. Okay. The first one has to deal with direct knowledge or experience. Direct knowledge or experience. We are then looking for an MD that has direct knowledge about the issue. Direct knowledge about the issue. Direct knowledge about the issue. Then there are some things that you may get from people 
indirect knowledge or indirect knowledge or experience. The person has not experienced it. So whatever he's telling you is a reportage or a perception of what is occurring. Then you may also find people who are external to the experience, but they can also give you some good information. External to the experience. And then sometimes you have correspondary subjects, a person who, who transfers between the internal and external. Now, some of the respondents are also time related. At a particular time, they, the phenomenon was being experienced, they were there, so they can tell you something. Some of them are event based. Event based means that a thing happened based on an issue, and they, that is why they are around. Now, a last one too is that some of them too can be transitional. They pass through time, they, like they transition. Today they are on it, tomorrow they are not on it. So today they are helping, tomorrow they are not helping. And then others, so they don't have much information about the issue or they have much information about the issue, depending on whether they have got a transitional relationship with the issue. I'm going to give all examples about that. They have got res snowball responder. Res snowball responder is somebody led you to that person. Somebody led you to that person. So you understand. So now let's go to, uh, back to our example again. Now we are looking at this paper on the car company. I want to see whether we can see some of the, this paper on the car company. I want to see, I want to assess whether we can find some of the type of different respondents here. The type of different respondents here, okay. Now, look at this scenario. Lanka Consult was born out of the owner manager's keen interest in automobiles. In 2003, the owner manager, where year to refer to as John, spent six months studying the car retail market in Accra. Okay. Now, because, look at this, he said, if you, and because of that, he studied these things and he said, to this market, he did a market study, to this market study, John developed an understanding of the business operations of importing and selling imported cars, imported used cars in Ghana. He also identified four challenges consumers face in purchasing the cars. These four challenges are coming from John. John is the one who gave us the four challenges, but it is coming from his own market study he carried out. So John is a direct experienced person, a person who directly, he started the company, he was there, experience the issue he knows what is happening so he can actually share knowledge about how they began and then it's not like we are reporting what john said we're actually telling that john said this because you're not, you're not reporting that's something you don't know about but we are reporting something that john himself experienced it so john is a somebody who has direct experience so he's a core respondent of the study but if you look at it carefully Okay, look at this one. Consumers who could not afford cars from new car retailers were out of choice with wayside and usually resorted to buying cars, imported, buying illegally imported cars. Oh, sorry. These cars, both new and used, were relatively cheaper since they were imported to Togo and driven across the Ghana Togo border illegally to avoid import duties. However, the Ghanaian police has been impounding these cars and arresting the owners. Now, John experienced something there, but there was also another experience by the Ghanaian police that had been captured by Ghana Web in 2002. That one is indirect. So John is now drawing from um, other indirect experiences, which he may not interview, but he captured from the internet. But it gives a description of what is happening and he asked to his data to corroborate his data. Now, from these observations, John realized, so these are things, these observations, and that is, these are things that John experienced himself. So they are seeing that there are things that, there are things that John experienced, there are things that he also heard and has happened and he captured them in the work. Partly, when you are writing and your case study, you are going to have respondents who have experienced something and you are also going to use sometimes data from people who have not experienced it, or but they are reporting what others have experienced. They are reporting what others have. So there can be indirect respondents and then direct respondents. Indirect respondents and direct respondents. Direct respondents have been experienced the scenario or the issue or the whatever you are talking about, but indirect have not experienced it. Okay. Now I just want to show another thing here. Okay. 
Now look at it. Look at this one here. Look at the timeline. So this is based on time. Now this is a time and event-based respondent. John himself is also an event-based respondent. But look at what I'm saying, what I'm saying here. Okay, John considered that creating an online present to support the firm business processes was critical to the ability to exploit this market opportunity. He explained that. Now this is based on what John himself had actually experienced. So John is telling you based on his own experiences. John is telling you based on his own experiences. But look at another one coming from a customer. Due to the skepticism of customers, John focused on using social interaction to develop personal business relationship with them. One of the customers, a resident medical doctor, this one I was there, I was there myself when I collected the data. Uh, a resident medical doctor comments that, with the exception of weekends, I barely had time to visit the cyber cafe to check my emails during the week. John used to frequently meet up with me in the hospital during the weekdays to discuss options available and my preferences. This information was then relayed to Braun. Braun is the German guy who shakes the cars down. By the, by, the, by the weekend, I received new details and pictures of my cars, of my cars of interest through email. I downloaded them and sometimes, I downloaded them and sometimes forward them to my fiancée. By the time I met John during the following week, I would make, I would have made my suggestions, my questions and decisions, or uh, I'll have my questions and, and, and or decision on the pictures. Now I realize that it even takes you almost a month for the person to be able to make a decision. A, a decision. You, you take the video, you take the pictures, you take the, the person watches it and come back next week. But this is an account about um, a, a woman's experience with the process. Now look at what is happening here. The woman is giving her own experience here. But she's also giving us other in, indirectly telling us other things that John does. Her experience is just that John gives her the car by video and then uh, pictures and she watches them and makes a decision. But indirectly, the woman too is giving information about the processes that underpin John's business. So John can tell you one thing, but the woman can tell you more. So this woman who is a respondent that came in as an indirect, as a, a person who directly experienced buying a car before, that's why I chose her. Then as I see, as interviewing her, she now gives me indirect information about other things that is happening that she may have not even done, because she's not there when John is sending the text messages and the emails to Braun. But she's giving me an account of what is happening with Braun. Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? So sometimes you're responding. There are some who can give you direct information, others who can give you indirect information that may also be relevant to your work. And you can even go more to, for example, in this scenario, I can then go to uh, John. John, can you show me uh, an e email discussion between you and Braun to verify or corroborate this information that when you get information from um, um, this medical doctor, you go and then send it to Braun. But me, I didn't need to do it because I saw him constructing the email to Bond where he attached the request of the woman. So I saw it myself and I observed it. So I didn't need to write it that give me evidence. But if I want to satisfy, if my whole study was about honesty instead, honesty in car sales, then I will, because my study is about honesty in car, car, uh, car sales, what then I'll do is that I will then go and ask that John, um, John, give me a, a transcript of a discussion between you and then Braun, detailing that you are giving the information that you received from the medical doctor to Braun. And then I'll attach it to my thesis to show honesty that this thing really occurs. But my study is not about honesty, so I don't need that level of data collection. Sometimes the nature of your data, your, your study, will tell you the, the level and detailed manner in which you collect data. I'm sorry that I've gone a little bit fast here. I just want to explain something and I'm getting a little bit excited because I'm teaching. Okay. And I know that I'm teaching well too in your understanding. I myself, I'm understanding myself better. So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that at this level, you are seeing that there are different types of respondents. One that can give you direct information, one who can give indirect information, and one who can also come out of snowball. Snowball is that somebody's re recommending to go and talk to the person. The person recommends another person to you. So let's look for a, a snowball res respondent in this one. Okay. Now, now.
Okay, I'm joined to look for. Okay. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. Okay, so now look at it. Now, it got to your time, the woman, the company, born, um, the John Hattie Brown bringing a leasing company to, a financial leasing company to help people who had, um, who are salaried workers to get um, a pre-financing arrangement. So one of the leading comp leasing companies and then the firm's bank and the international bank accepted the first proposal. These, um, please, you said I should admit honorable Henry Yadom Boachi. He's not showing there. I've, I've admitted everybody. There's not, he's not showing here. If he's showing here, then I would, I would admit him. Sorry, Wakefield, he's not showing here. Okay. Okay, so let's continue. When Honorable come shows again, I'll, 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 I'll um, admit him. But I'm mean, admitting everybody who is showing up anyway. Now, the proposals of these institutions were as follows. The leasing company's proposal, the international bank proposal, and then um, the, 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 the nature in which you have to qualify for, for, for the, the nature of the customers who could qualify or the description of customers who could qualify for the particular facility. Now, when you, I finished, I said the first customer to benefit from the scheme was a young medical doctor who was keen on buying a 2000 Mercedes C180. The doctor was prepared to pay 20% of the total cost of the car and the leasing company provided 80% of the total cost of the car. The medical doctor comments that. Now, this is a snowball person. I was chatting, I was interviewing, um, John and John mentioned that, and the first person they did the person this thing for was this particular medical doctor. So he told me that if I want to get information, he can link me to that medical doctor so that I can get an, uh, from a, from her perspective the what she experienced in assessing this particular facility. I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. So I went to the woman, and the woman then told me this story. Good. Though I had been referred to the firm by two other doctors, the woman herself too is a referral from other doctors. So that means that at least you can see the snowballing effect means it's coming from even other people. Okay, I've admitted the material. Good. Who purchased similar vague vehicles from the firms? I was initially skeptical about the whole process. I even asked a friend who also engaged in export import business in Ghana to sit in the initial negotiation and ascertain the credibility of the firm. After the three first three meetings, we were convinced. John offered a detailed explanation of the whole process and arranged a meeting with the leasing company. All the necessary documentation, contractual agreements were provided and we found them to be simple and explanatory. Additionally, we also received letters of credit of the firm from, leasing, from, from, from the leasing company and then the firm's bank. Now, um, there are multiple things happening here at the same time, and I'll come to it. After signing the contract, the medical doctor introduced her father and another medical doctor to purchase cars from the firm. Now, you see another snowball happening here. So I can even go again and talk to the father and then talk to the medical doctor, again, another medical doctor again. But what I'm trying to show you here now, look at the person's quotation. Now, the woman is confirming, one, how the arrangement of cars were being bought. Number two, the... the, 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 the the, the importance of you establishing the credibility of John by bringing a third party inside. Number three, by also making sure that you don't just say yes at the first instance or the first meeting, doing subsequent meetings until you are convinced or until a point of decision is made. Number, number three, you can see here that John offered a detailed explanation of the process and then arranged a meeting. So John also then brought the leasing company and just that, just, you know, just the leasing company, other legal things had to be done. Letters of credit was used from both the, the leasing company and then the firm's bank. All this to establish the credibility of the purchasing agreement. And the purchasing agreement went on. Now, it now tells you other information which I've not put in, in my work. I've not put in, in it, I don't put any, um, I have not put any information about uh, letters of credit and from the firm's bank and any of the things that I've, 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 I've written in the particular case study. But now the, the student, the medical doctor is passing new information which enhances the credibility of the work that I have here. 
So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that you can have different type of respondents that can give you different type of information. But what happens here is that they all come, they should all come back in triangulating to and helping us understand the data that we are collecting and then the answers we are looking for. Okay. So let's go back to uh study. Okay. Somebody said, why snowball or the rationale for snowball? Oh, snowball is a type of sampling approach. It, it actually explains that when you throw, if you, those of you, those of you who have lived in UK and in the US before, or in countries where there's snow, when you throw a snowball and it's as it's rolling, it's actually more snow gleams onto it and gets attached to it. So this is a type of sampling approach in which um, as you get one respondent, he refers you to another. And then, and then refers you to another. So the ball increases in size, or your sample size increases as the people are being referred and referred and referred. Relevant people are being referred. You, you have access to more people who can give you more relevant information. That's why we call it a snowball effect. Now, the, the, I mentioned that your, your respondents can differ. For example, look at one a study here. The person is doing a study on mobiles, mobile learning in Ghana, has administrators, lecturers, and then students. And for the, each of the universities, is comparing them. It's going to look at how many people did, and you see categorizing the type of respondents. There's institutional leader, program coordinator, program content developer, systems and network administrator, and then you also have a, a technical support and timetable developer. All of them are different levels. And he's now comparing them across the pair of collected data, private university, public university, private university, private university two, public university one, and public university two. And then he's comparing, he's comparing the respondents and what the information, the interviews he carried across these different respondents. So it's important that you identify your respondents, you identify the role they play and what value they'll give to your work, and you find, find the context in which you are using them. Find the context in which you are using them. Okay, so multiple sources of data. In collecting the data, you can draw from multiple sources, one being archival records, documents and reports, or statistical records, direct observation, and which can also, then non participant and non participant of the observation. Either you are participating yourself or somebody is participating on your behalf. And then also you have physical product examination or artifact examination, taking an actual document, an actual. And, and, and physical object and then examining it, or a virtual object and examining it and reviewing it. It can happen that way. Then interviews and focus group discussions. Okay. So this is data coming from the organization, data, um, data on the financial profile of Nanka Council. This is how the data will come. So I'm drawing that data here to be able to use for my analysis. And this is the cost of mobile handset by used by traders. The cost of a new handset is around 35 to 30 USD. And then the cost of a used um, handset is 20, 20 and 35. So you actually have an idea of the cost of different handsets here. Then you also have um, a website that you can use for artifact examination. This is my fan ride automobile. This is the website, the studio name website of Nanga Consult. When you go there, you can see the different facilities and the different operations and functions they have on the website. You can select, search for cars, you can buy a car, you can look at the latest car and car lock entries. You can even submit your own specification of a car that you are looking for. So that you can be able to see whether you can get it for you. Okay. Then this is active examination where you are looking at the logic of data flow or information flow within the organization. How does the information flow within the organization? What do they use the information, information flow for? So in this particular scenario, we are talking about website design and how, and how uh, what goes in, we are talking about um, selling of the cars and what goes into it. For example, the car starts from process A, B. The customer finds the car as it goes in to the website or directly to the manager, then it goes into negotiation. The manager contacts somebody abroad. The person abroad brings the car, the concept, and the car, the, the negotiation is, is done. And then when the car's negotiation is done, the payment terms are agreed to, the car is then shipped to the country. So it just talks to you about the logical flow of information and decision-making through the process. 
and this one is also a showcase in the case. So if you look at the case study, there are things like this to be able to let us understand the case better. So the person put all of these things inside the case. Because this is another section of the case. Uh, um, oh, sorry. My slide is not turning. Now, this is another case that has to do with market women in Nigeria. And we're studying um, this one, I'm giving it to you already. That's the third, uh, third paper. The, we're, we're doing a study on mobiles and market women in Nigeria. But the, when we finished the paper, we submitted it. The authors, the reviewer said that no. You are doing this study and you are talking about Wuze market and then uh, Abuja and then uh, Gaza market. We want to know uh, Nigeria market. We want to know the distance between these places so that we can have an idea of why it is important to use a mobile phone. I want to also know that uh, and have a, a depiction of what you collected in the, from the field. So now we looked at, um, we are finished collecting our data at that time. So then we had to go to the news agency of Nigeria that had a picture of one of the markets. I think this is the Wuze market. And it could show us how tomatoes was being sold in the market. So we took that picture. Then we also had a map of Nigeria to be able to point it out and show where all the markets locations in our data that we have collected were. And then to show, the, show the distance between the different places and how they were using mobile phones in their business. So that is also another scenario. Sometimes you may have to even use maps to enhance understanding of what you have collected. Now, because of the fact that you are doing a case study, we need to see the direct quotations from the people. So sometimes we occasionally want to see you quoting directly from the people. Like, um, Antia Kosia opined that Mercy mentions that these are actual quotations and direct quotations from the respondent to show that you were there to collect the data. The same thing to do with John's study too. Direct quotes on, from, the, uh, from, the, from the, one of the med, med, resident medical doctors talking about how the choices of John influence the purchase of the car. So you can see though, that's at the next slide. Okay. So we have different, different things that influence us. the direct quotes from consumers and from the respondents. We have got the, the research model and we have got the different aspects of the, the research questions that we have, the research framework that we have, all of these things, and even the skills of the researcher can influence the type of case study you are doing and how you do your case study well. Then I mentioned earlier that to be able to do a good case study, you need what we call the case study protocol. The case study protocol will include the proposed strategy for collecting the data, and then we are almost running up. Um, and, uh, and then the process you are going to go through in carrying out the case study. So an overview of the project, the population of target respondents, the responsive procedure, the questionnaire, the active snapshots that you did on the field, and then you also have the list of respondents and the case study report, the draft one, the case study report, the draft one. Thank you very much, slide 37. So what we are emphasizing here is that when you look at it in your, your thesis, when you're starting, you start with the case study protocol. When you finish, you develop a case study database. That would have told us, but technically you don't produce it in your work. What you show in your work is the case study report, which will be in your work. And at the end of your work, you show us the list of respondents. Sometimes you'll be required, the questionnaire you use. And sometimes if there are some narratives that you, you want to just put in the back end, because you have already, already done some level, so many levels of abstraction. But there are some of the background information you want to put some narratives in, you can put them on behind. Please, the, the Jojo, the lecture slides and everything, they are all online. They are all in the Sakai, in the resources section. You can have it there. It's already there. It's already there. Just that the video, the video of last week is also there. Okay, so that gives you the case study database. That gives you the case study database. Good. That gives you a case study database. Okay. Now, I, I want to pause here so that next week we can continue and then take your questions because I need to be able to explain to detail when I'm talking about validity in case study and reliability in case study, and then show you differences in different people's case studies, how they're able to establish the validity and reliability. So I don't want to jump into it. But what I want to emphasize here is that whenever you are doing the case, start by your case study protocol. And after that, and whilst you're collecting your data, your case, start developing your case study database, which is developed during the data collection process and after. So by the time you finish, you can be able to put things together and then submit your case study. Okay. Now, um, what I also advise is that 
when you take any research paper that has case study and you look at the methodology that was used to write a case study, so they can appreciate whether you can identify the protocol in it and then the case study database aspects of it in it. For example, the paper that I wrote, this paper that I have here, I can just show you a little bit of the, so look at it. I want to show you a little bit of the case, the study methods. Now look at it here. Um, okay. So what's he saying? The study seeks to investigate the impact of mobile phones on micro training activities of women traders in Ghana. A mixed method approach consistent with the same when the case study was adopted to, in order to explore consistency of findings and obtain richness and, and detail to understand how mobile phones impact the micro training activities. So now I brought Cresswell. A survey was conducted to explore the mobile phone usage behavior of 136 traders. A follow up case study was conducted with four traders to develop an in depth understanding of the mobile usage behavior and then to gain insight of, of to observations from the survey. So, this one is a, a kind of a sequential mixed method. You do one and it informs the second one. So we did a quantitative first and it informed the second one, that's a qualitative. An exploratory case study approach was adopted since it supports the research objective set at the beginning. Jim. Now remember I mentioned about divorce. Um, this research also sought to benefit from, from the rigors of designing and collecting data and analyzing the data as discussed by divorce. Please try and find divorce work. I don't remember whether I still have it. But the reference is in this paper. The paper has been shared with you already. The mixed method approach enabled us to develop propositions on the mobile phone usage behavior of traders. Data was collected over a four month period. So now we have an idea of what happened there. Three sets of interviews were conducted. The first set of interviews was conducted with the women traders. A questionnaire was structured to reflect the framework presented in figure one. So that's one. So you are. We are wondering where the papers you sent are. I mean, the paper we are discussing now. This paper we are discussing now has been given to you already. I attached them earlier. And they are also in the Dropbox. Anyway, let me, let me try and, let me try and, let me try and attach them again. Sorry, please. I just want to, so this paper we are discussing right now is this one. But the other papers that we were looking at earlier was the e-commerce one. And there's another paper we looked at at Nigeria. So the, the one I showed the map of Nigeria is coming from the last paper. Okay, so let's continue. Now we're emphasizing something here. I hope everybody's okay. Let me admit Michael. Okay, so um, you see that three sets of interviews were conducted. The first set was done. A sample size of 150 was chosen from markets Kaneshi and Abubushi in Accra. Out of 150, you see here, yeah, I didn't explain why I chose Kaneshi and Abubushi, but um, in, in some reasons, in some papers, you may have to explain why you chose those ones. Okay. Out of the 150, 136 were successfully administered. This is the quality, quantitative part, representing 91% response rate. A total of 57% from Kaneshi and 44% and from Abubushi. Data from the survey were analyzed through the descriptive statistics using SPSS. The second set of interviews was conducted with four traders randomly selected from Medina and Makola markets. So where we did the case study is different from where we did the quanti quantitative so that we have a better picture of what is happening in Ghana. So the quantitative was taking place in Kanishi and Gobushi. Then Medina and Makola was where we did the, um, the qualitative. Okay, then it goes on to say that the objective was to get a, re a, a representation of ma traders across four markets in Accra and to capture rich mobile and trading experiences from different markets. So you see why we are using different markets in all of this. Okay. Then two case studies for, from the four in interviews were presented in the paper. Because it's a short paper, I need to I present only two. I didn't present all the four. The third set of interviews were done with four of the marketing personnel of two mobile network operators in Ghana and resellers of um, mobile net, mobile prepaid cards and mobile accessories. They were these, these, there are currently five major operators in Ghana, those at that time. 
The interviews were conducted with marketing personnel from Tico and Zane. Tico, Zane, and, re and resellers of prepaid cards and mobile accessories. The interviews in both sets, with respect to the services they have to benefit, to, to, so with respect to services they have that have become beneficial to traders. The interviews in both sets of the information, in both sets of in, the interviews in both sets of interviews were recorded and transcribed. And copies of transcribed interviews were sent to interviewers, interviewees to check the and resolve discrepancies. Now let me answer um, Isaac's question. So Isaac, this one, you asked that so prof, did you send the, the, the thing back? Okay, so what we send back is not line by line transcript, but more of a summary of what you thought you have found and whether we are on the right path. That's our summary. That's a very short term. I hope Isaac can understand. We didn't send the line by line transcription to them. Line by line transcription. Well, I, wasn't, I wasn't the one who asked that question. Oh, sorry. Okay. okay, but at least I hope you understand that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. We didn't send line by line. Sometimes you can't send line by line. If I go to back to your market tomorrow, we didn't send line by line. <laughs> you send line by line. Certainly not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so the approach to analyzing the case study was primarily the use of pattern logic, pattern margin logic, which I'll teach you guys. That's the spin by yin. You see, everything is about yin, 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 yin. And yin uses more of a positivist approach to handling cases. Okay. But because I am a realist, I can draw from both positivist, interpretivist, uh, interpretivist, and I can draw from quantitative and qualitative. So I can draw from many, many, many um, different um, schools of thought concerning philosophy. That's why you see me using yin. Okay. Now, we sought for results that can strengthen the validity of our theoretical framework, figure one, or the conceptual framework. Figure further by scrutinizing the contents of the case and, 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 detail, and detailing findings to provide answers to the research question. So this is findings. Next week we'll look at we'll look at um of course we now have to teach I have to teach you validity. I have to teach you first of all how do you get the work the the um the, the data collection part and how do you even present the findings? We'll look at that. And I'll even use different papers to explain it. I like teaching you guys a lot, especially in this manner. I get my time to take my time to teach you. And use different scenarios to explain it. Now let me pause here and go to Sakai so that those of you who have to go for another class can go. I want to show you something, some few information that we put on Sakai recently. So let's go to my okay. Okay. 